Dive into the intricate world of Aristotle's philosophy, where every sentence holds meaning, yet not all can be deemed true or false. Let's unravel the complexities of propositions, definitions, and accidents as we explore the nuances of his work on interpretation. Aristotle posits that a sentence becomes a candidate for truth or falsehood only when a verb complements a noun, transforming it into a statement. This statement can affirm as in Pedro sleeps or negate, Pedro does not sleep. It can also be expanded with a complement such as Pedro is just, adding layers to its meaning. The philosopher further distinguishes between definitions and properties. A definition like rational biped is intimately linked to the essence it describes, allowing for a two-way convertibility. For instance, if it is capable of learning grammar, it is a man. If it is a man, it is capable of learning grammar. However, this mutual relationship does not hold for all properties, as not all who can get sick are necessarily men, though all men can get sick. Aristotle's exploration then leads us to accidents, elements that may or may not pertain to an object, unlike properties or definitions. Take the phrase holding the glass of whiskey. It's not inherently linked to Humphrey Bogart, despite the whispers of gossip. This lack of convertibility marks it as an accident, not a property, genus, or definition. The philosopher's stance on definition is intriguing. He seems to suggest that a definition is not inherently true or false, as it transcends temporal processes. It represents the essence of an object which contains its possibilities without being limited by them. This perspective challenges our understanding of definitions, prompting us to consider their stability and relationship with the objects they describe. In conclusion, Aristotle's examination of language and logic offers a profound insight into the nature of knowledge and existence. Through his analysis of statements, definitions, and accidents, we gain a deeper appreciation for the precision and complexity of philosophical inquiry. Diving into the world of language, we encounter the fascinating concept of paronyms, terms that share a striking resemblance yet differ in inflection. Aristotle, the ancient philosopher, shed light on this phenomenon, emphasizing the subtle but significant changes in suffixes. Take barbarian and barbarity, for example. Both sprout from the root barber, yet their suffixes alter their meaning. However, the waters of paronyms are murkier than they first appear. The term ending is used in Oxford, contrasting with Aristotle's suffix, which could be a nod to the nuances of the Greek language. This raises an intriguing question. Could prefixes also play a role in creating paronyms? Consider capitalist and metacapitalist. Their shared root and differing prefixes suggest a semantic kinship, hinting at a broader definition of paronyms. This leads us to a potential classification within paronyms themselves. Light paronyms, like barbarian and barbarity, have an obvious connection while heavy paronyms such as insecurity and security require a deeper etymological dive to reveal their shared essence. Aristotle's perspective on paronyms seems to demand an ontological similarity, a shared essence, unlike the broader grammatical interpretation where case in different contexts could be considered paronyms. The philosopher's view suggests that true paronyms must resonate with each other at a fundamental level, beyond mere linguistic coincidence. Dialectical propositions are not just any statements. They are crafted inquiries that hold weight across various spectrums of society. They are the questions that resonate with everyone, the majority or the wise, serving as the foundation for philosophical exploration and debate. Consider the question, is the life of the just the happiest? This is a dialectical proposition because it commands respect and prompts a choice between two distinct alternatives. It transforms from a mere proposition into a problem that demands deliberation. The dialectical method thrives on such problems, extracting from them the essence of philosophical inquiry. Now let's delve into the process of generating propositions. A respectable proposition such as one should do good to friends can be challenged by its contrary. One should do harm to friends. However, the dialectic doesn't stop there. By opposing the contrary, we arrive back at a respectable stance. One should not do harm to friends. This interplay of ideas is crucial in understanding the dialectical approach. Similarly, opinions that resemble respectable ones can also be considered. Take the statement, the perception of opposites is the same. If this holds true, then a related proposition might assert that knowledge of opposites is the same. 
Yet Aristotle draws a distinction between perception which requires the presence of the object and knowledge which does not. Through this intricate dance of propositions and their counterparts, dialectic weaves a complex web of understanding, challenging us to consider every angle and perspective. It is in this rigorous examination of ideas that the true value of dialectical propositions is revealed, guiding us through the vast landscape of philosophical thought. Dive into the fabric of language, where every word we utter is a thread woven into the tapestry of communication. Today we unravel the mysteries of nouns and verbs, the fundamental elements that give structure to our sentences and clarity to our thoughts. A noun is more than just a word. It's a spoken sound that carries meaning by the agreement of a community. Picture a Chinese person exclaiming, ouch! The sentiment is universally understood, transcending the barriers of language. Yet, when they speak in their native tongue, the significance is lost to those not privy to the conventions of that language. Nouns are the anchors of language representing people, places, and things, and are as diverse as the ideas they convey. Now let's shift our focus to verbs, the dynamic counterparts to nouns. A verb is essentially a noun that encapsulates time and asserts something about its subject. Consider the phrase drink water. It speaks of the water being consumed. This perspective on verbs is more encompassing than the narrow view of them merely as action words. After all, not all verbs are about action. Some, like is in Peter is stone, serve as links connecting the subject to a state or quality. The philosopher's lens reveals more. Verb flexion refers to the various tenses beyond the present indicative. Drink water in its simple form is present, but verbs can stretch across time. Similarly, nouns can undergo inflection, taking on different cases to express relationships like possession. Of Pedro transforms the noun Pedro into a genitive case signaling ownership. Lastly, we encounter the essence of language, definition and property. A definition strives to capture the very essence of a thing like rational biped for humans. Properties are traits inherent to that essence, such as being able to learn grammar. These concepts are intertwined with the objects they describe, convertible in their nature. They stand firm against challenges, distinguishing a man from a kangaroo, not merely by physical traits, but by the rationality that sets us apart. Thus, language is not just a tool for expression, it's a mirror reflecting our understanding of the world and ourselves. In the tapestry of language, words weave intricate patterns of meaning, often leading us to ponder the nature of similarity. How can the same thing be known by different names or different things be called the same? Let's unravel the threads of numerical, generic, and specific similarities and explore the nuanced world of synonyms. Consider the way a child's address to their parent evolves over time. At six, the affectionate daddy is common, but by 16, the more formal father takes its place. The person in question hasn't changed. Only the name has. This is numerical similarity where one object receives multiple labels, each reflecting a different facet or stage of relationship. Moving on, let's delve into generic similarity. This occurs when distinct entities share a common attribute. Take, for instance, the broad category of living being. It applies equally to a man and an ox, to Seabiscuit, the famed racehorse, and Toby Maguire, the celebrated actor. So, despite their vast differences, the same predicate can be ascribed to each. Specific similarity narrows the scope, focusing on predicates that are less universal and more intimately connected to the individual. Man is a term that brings us closer to understanding Peter than the broader living being does. Here, the species acts as a more specific predicate, offering greater clarity about the object in question. Peter and Paul, for example, are both men, sharing a specific similarity that distinguishes them within the larger category of living beings. Synonyms are the chameleons of language adapting their hues to match the context. When we call both a man and an ox animals, we're using animals synonymously based on their shared attribute as living beings. Yet synonyms can stretch across all categories from substance to action. The verb to trick might be synonymous with to deceive, but to finish can mean both to carry out and to give the final touch, revealing that synonymy is not always straightforward. It depends on the specific usage of the terms. Finally, we reach the synonymous thesis, a concept championed by the wise. It's the pursuit of a definition that unites seemingly disparate things, such as defining communism as a culture in the anthropological sense, a system of beliefs, symbols, and emotional reactions. Through this lens, communism and the Yoruba culture are both recognized as cultures, 
It's a testament to the power of language to bridge gaps and find common ground, even among the most diverse of concepts. In the realm of rhetoric, words wield the power to shape our understanding, often in ways more complex than we realize. Take homonyms, for instance. They are words identical in form but distinct in meaning. Consider the word man. It can refer to a figure in a photograph or a living, breathing individual. Both are called men, yet their essences diverge. This is the crux of the homonymous thesis, a concept that sparked debate between thinkers like Max Weber and Ortega y Gasset. Weber labeled inter-individual relations as social, a term Ortega y Gasset reserved for impersonal interactions, like the customary handshake at a party. This handshake, rooted in an unspoken agreement of mutual harmlessness, exemplifies how the meaning of social can be implicit and ever-evolving. Moving from the subtleties of homonyms to the mechanics of persuasion, we encounter the enthymeme. This rhetorical device is a truncated argument relying on a premise the audience is presumed to accept. For example, asserting someone's wealth by mentioning their position on Manchester United's roster leverages common knowledge for persuasive effect. This technique echoes the principles found in Aristotle's Poetics, where the value of artistic imitation hinges on its ability to trigger real-life memories. The more a play or novel resonates with lived experiences, the more it enlightens and delights, fulfilling its purpose by awakening the audience's knowledge and recognition. But not all sentences in rhetoric are created equal. Only when a name meets a verb do we encounter a proposition capable of being true or false. Pedro sleeps is such a statement, open to verification. These declarative sentences can assert as in, Pedro sleeps, or negate as in, Pedro doesn't sleep. Complexity arises when multiple subjects share a verb like Pedro and Paul sleep, which can be dissected into individual assertions. Aristotle, in his quest for clarity, simplifies this by focusing on the essence of objects, their properties and definitions, while excluding accidents that do not define an object's true nature. In this way, the gender and differentiation of terms become intertwined, revealing the nuanced interplay of language and logic in rhetoric. Dive into the realm of philosophical inquiry, where the classification of concepts isn't just about labels, but about unlocking the doors to different types of investigation. The philosopher presents us with four classes, definition, property, gender, and accident. Each holds a unique key to understanding the essence of what things are and how we come to know them. The philosopher's framework begins with the class of definition. It's a two-way mirror reflecting the object itself. A rational biped mirrors a man, and vice versa. This reciprocity is the heartbeat of definition, where one implies the other with precision. Property, akin to definition, also shares this intimate dance of conversion with the object. The capability to learn grammar is inherently human, and being human inherently suggests the potential for grammar. It's a property that, like a shadow, never strays from its source. Then we have gender, which is a broader category, a halfway house that intersects with definition. Being a man means being an animal, but the reverse isn't always true. Differentiation, on the other hand, is a sorting hat within the same gender, separating bipeds from quadrupeds within the animal kingdom. It's a generic trait that can be applied broadly, not confined to numerical or species identity. Accident is the wild card, unpredictable and unbound. Holding a glass of whiskey doesn't define a man, nor does being a man mean one must hold a whiskey glass. Pregnancy doesn't exclusively define a woman, and not all women experience pregnancy. Accident is the unpredictable guest at the party, capable of association but never a defining feature. The philosopher's definition of man as a rational biped stands apart from temporal constraints, suggesting definitions transcend time while hinting at its passage. In this philosophical journey, we've seen how each class not only defines what an object is, but also shapes the path of our understanding. As we ponder these classes, we grasp the delicate threads that weave the tapestry of knowledge. Each thread a class, each class a world of its own. In the realm of philosophy, the intricacies of argument and opinion form the bedrock of dialectical reasoning. Aristotle, a towering figure in the discipline, dissected these elements with precision, offering insights that continue to resonate through the ages. Aristotle introduced us to the concept of dialectical propositions, which hinge on the opinions held by all, the majority, or the wise. Take, for instance, the question, 
is the life of the just the happiest? This query demanding a yes or no response transforms into a problem, a dialectical problem due to its interrogative nature. Dialectical deductions draw not only from respectable opinions, but also from those that mirror or oppose them. Consider the respectable proposition. One should treat friends well. Its direct opposite suggests mistreatment of friends, while the contrary to this opposition circles back to the original respectable stance. This interplay of opinions forms the backbone of a dialectical debate. Knowledge. Aristotle also distinguished between perception and knowledge. Perception requires the presence of the object, whereas knowledge does not. For example, understanding that the perception of cold is akin to the perception of heat leads to a similar assertion about knowledge of these opposites. This subtle differentiation is crucial in grasping the nuances of dialectical reasoning. To determine if a term is multifaceted, one must explore its opposites. If chill out implies calmness, its opposite is agitation. Yet when we say, the tea is cold, we imply the absence of heat, not agitation. These variations reveal that terms like cold can have homonymous uses or share a common thread depending on the context. Aristotle's exploration of topics and dialectical propositions is a testament to the depth and complexity of philosophical inquiry. His analysis of respectable opinions, the nature of perception versus knowledge, and the connotations of terms all contribute to a richer understanding of dialectical reasoning. As we delve into these ancient teachings, we uncover the timeless relevance of Aristotle's thought, inviting us to engage with the world of ideas with renewed curiosity and rigor. As words are chameleons, changing hues and shades of meaning with context and usage. Take just, a term that stands for moral rectitude and also describes something nearly tight. The adverb justly inherits this duality. In one breath we might commend, he acted justly, lauding his fairness. In another we might observe, he tied his shoelaces justly, noting the precision of his knots. The term's class can signal a shift in meaning. Consider the word vow. When one takes a vow of silence, it's a solemn, often religious commitment. Yet, when giving a vote to a mayor, vow transforms into a political pledge. Aristotle's classic example distinguishes good for health from good as a moral quality. Both uses are tied to well-being, yet they diverge into physical and spiritual realms. When a term like donkey can be predicated of an object in multiple ways, its usage is context-dependent. A donkey as a beast of burden is quite different from a donkey as an animal with a penchant for hydration. A hundred donkeys would be needed to transport all this merchandise, we say, or my donkey drinks a lot of water each sentence calling forth a different aspect of donkey. The genus of a term can lead to multiple meanings. Animal is the genus of donkey, but consider its opposites, inanimate objects and refined gentlemen. Thus, donkey can mean a living creature, as in, my donkey drinks a lot of water, or it can imply a lack of intelligence, as in, he's nothing but a donkey, a boor. Relationships between terms can also differentiate meaning. The word pastor varies significantly when paired with Protestant versus mountain. A Protestant pastor leads a congregation, while a mountain pastor might tend to livestock. These homonyms share a name but not a nature. Finally, when multiple terms describe something, each must be scrutinized for potential homonyms. Take the description of Chavez's program as simple and funny. If simple is dissected, does it mean unadorned and dull, or does it imply an artful portrayal of simplicity? When funny is examined, does it mean successful in entertaining? If so, simple cannot mean without grace. It must be a homonym, pointing instead to a technique that captivates by imitating simplicity. In the dance of language, words pirouette from one meaning to another, guided by the subtle choreography of context, class, and connection. Understanding this linguistic ballet is key to mastering the art of communication. In the realm of philosophy, words carry the weight of worlds, each term a vessel for a multitude of meanings. Olavo Bilac, in his poem, delves into the intricate web of implications surrounding a simple yet profound concept, wanting. Bilac begins with a declaration of intent, a poetic profession that eschews grandiosity in favor of genuine value. I do not want Capitolian Zeus, Herculean and beautiful, carved in divine marble with the chisel. Here, wanting is not just a desire but a tapestry of choices, intentions, and expressions of the self. 
The poet navigates through the opposites of wanting, from choosing to rejecting, from agreeing to resisting. Each term with its antithesis hints at the subtle shades of human inclination, where demanding meets its opposite in exempting, an intermediary like partially exempting emerges, revealing the spectrum of human will. Bilak uncovers a paradox within wanting. The lyrical self possesses the power to choose, yet this choice is imbued with a devotional character, compelling the chooser into a paradoxical dance of freedom and force. Wanting thus becomes a complex act, one that is both a declaration of autonomy and an admission of being irresistibly drawn to an attractive force. The term want shifts in meaning when tied to action versus substance. In the poem, wanting something as tangible as ice cream is immediate and seemingly trivial, while wanting an action, like the creation of art, taps into a symbolic reality with far-reaching consequences. This distinction illuminates the depth of wanting as more than a mere whim. It is a reflection of the self and its place in the world. In conclusion, Bilak's exploration of wanting transcends the literal to touch upon the essence of human experience. The poet's choice to reject the grandeur of Capitolian Zeus is not a simple preference but a profound statement of identity and purpose. Through the lens of wanting, we glimpse the intricate dance of human desire, choice, and the eternal quest for meaning that defines our existence. In the realm of the divine, the term deity carries a weight that is often contrasted with the fragility of mortal. Zeus, the paramount god of mythology, embodies principles that stretch beyond mere existence. He is the eternal antithesis to the temporal, the secular, the vulgar. His stature as chief stands in stark opposition to the notion of a servant, painting a picture of a hierarchy where divinity reigns supreme. Yet between the absolutes of deity and mortality there lies an intriguing middle ground, the demigod. This intermediary, though not always recognized with a clear gradation, bridges the gap without fully belonging to either side. Homer's Odysseus, a descendant of Zeus yet not a demigod, exemplifies this ambiguity. Similarly, the eternal opposes the temporal, and the vulgar finds its rival in the aristocrat, with subtle shades of more or less vulgar suggesting a spectrum rather than a dichotomy. When one exclaims, He did this because he is Zeus! It's an acknowledgement of extraordinary power, be it natural, supernatural, or moral. The term divine, as used by Socrates, can be a simple inflection to mean excellently. The fusion of Zeus with Capitolian, originating from the capital, a pagan temple, evokes the image of a deity's representation, a statue embodying myth and patronage. The Herculean ideal, meanwhile, is rich with connotations of mythic strength, arduous effort, and perfect male beauty. It stands without an opposite, yet it is contrasted with weakness and ease, suggesting a continuum of effort and aesthetic. Herculean deeds are those that garner glory, and when paired with beautiful, it intensifies the notion hinting at a superlative form of physical allure. Differentiation, a concept that allows us to distinguish between entities within a genre, is crucial for understanding these connotations. It's what separates the bipedal nature of humans from ostriches. And it's why we don't refer to a chair as quadrupedal. The term foot becomes homonymous, losing its relevance outside the genre. In the dance of opposites and intermediaries, differentiation is the choreographer guiding each term to its place in the grand taxonomy of our language and thought. Dive into the depths of Aristotelian philosophy, where the concept of accident challenges the very essence of what we perceive. Aristotle's scrutiny of language and existence offers a profound understanding of how we categorize and comprehend the world around us. Consider a man, assigned to him descriptors, rational, terrestrial, biped. When these terms unite to describe one entity, none is accidental to the concept of man. Yet introduce white into the mix, rational white biped, and white emerges as accidental for the essence of man is not inherently tied to color. The essence of a man can be distilled to rational biped equating to man sleeps when the rational biped does. But add literate to the equation, the literate rational biped sleeps, and literate becomes an accident in relation to man. Holding a glass of whiskey or being literate are not intrinsic to man's definition even if there's a partial conversion. Literate may differentiate within the species man, but not within the broader genus animal. Aristotle's choice of examples, nouns and verbs, raises questions. Why not two verbs? Or a noun inflection with a verb?
Consider dominated, a verb outside the present tense, and for whom to win, a noun inflection paired with a verb inflection. These are not statements, which are sentences that can be true or false. Instead, they are expressions that require additional context to convey meaning. A statement is a combination of words that, when true or false, becomes an affirmation or negation. He sleeps or he does not sleep are statements. An expression, on the other hand, might be an isolated noun or a verb not linked to a noun. Man is an expression equivalent to rational terrestrial biped. But why isn't bummer a statement? It lacks meaning without context. I lost money, bummer. In contrast, man runs is a statement inherently true or false, complete in itself. In Aristotle's examination, we find that language is not just a tool for communication, but a reflection of our understanding of reality. The distinction between what is essential and what is accidental in our descriptions reveals the layers of complexity in our conceptual framework. Through this lens, we can appreciate the nuances of our world and the words we use to describe it.